Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, so before we started, I would like to ask you how many people here are Android developer? OK. How many of you have a Raspberry Pi? Nice. So you're perfect for the slot. Um, so I'm Chen. Uh, I will, I'm originally from China and I live in Paris. And I work as an Android developer on a daily basis. So today we have a kind of a tight agenda. But don't worry, we're going to have fun together. Um, so last year, I built uh, something uh, called Rock, Paper, Scissor Hand Game Robot with Android Things. Uh, how many of you have ever heard of Android Things? OK. Um, so what does the machinery look like? It actually, uh, when I was a child, I always play with myself because I, so I was the only child and uh, I always get lonely. I was thinking, can I build a machine to uh, play the Rock, Paper, Scissor with me? So I started with Android Things because I'm an Android developer, and Android Things is quite easy for me to get started. So on this picture, as you can see, the machine played rocks, and uh, our uh, participant played scissors. So actually, the uh, machine uh, be uh, beat the, uh, our participant. In our live video, it looked like this. So that's my coworker, Michael. Um, he kind of just won the game. And you can see at the end of the game, the, um, the robot tried to predict what happened between the two players. So if I explain my project in an XKCD way, uh, that's a human who wants to play with, with, a, with a robot. And the robot was like, uh, oh, uh, the human just play kind of uh, what's kind of a gesture. And I can tell him if he won or if he lost. Um, so if we break down the project, there are several parts of the project. I, I built a tool to collect data from my coworkers and my friends. And uh, there's all the hardware components and all the applicative code. So the data collection tool was actually built uh, simply with Node.js and Express.js. Uh, uh, it works as a mobile um, web, web mobile app. And I, was, I, I deployed it on Firebase uh, hosting and with Firebase functions. So it looks like this. So you would ask why uh, all the way to, to build a tool like this. Actually, it's really hard to find raw images, which is close to reality. And this tool helps me to get um, as many uh, data as I needed to train the machine learning model that I used to build the brain of my robots. So with this uh, web application, I kind of collected a lot of images. They're definitely not compliant with GDPR. Um, but I managed to get around 200 photos per gesture. Um, at the beginning, uh, my ambition was building something with also the Spock and the laser. But turns out, it was really hard to recognize correctly the scissor and the Spock. So the version kind of uh, fall back to a, to a simpler one. Um, with Android Things, um, the whole project took um, a little bit budget. But if you have a starter kit, everything's really easy. So I was happy with the result because the robot works really well. It's a, it has a fun uh, part of it. And this is the Android things I use. And this is the driver I use to um, control different uh, robot arms. If you've ever worked on a robot, robotic project, you know this kind of server motor is the typical server motor you use to control the movements. And this is very important for the later session we're, uh, we're having. So just remember, it's a 12, uh, it's a 16 channel, 12 bit um, servo motor driver. And during the um, process of building this robot, I also use some glue guns and uh, basically an anything I can find at my own place. So the final uh, result looks like this. I was really happy because um, I think I can keep working on the tool until the day I saw the news. So Google is actually um, um, put a stop on the Android Things project, and they don't have uh, any uh, future timeline for the project. Um, for a moment, I was really sad, because I, I, I was thinking working uh, further on the project. But at this moment, I was saying, yeah, let's find some alternatives to, to the project. That's why um, I'm switching to Kotlin Native. You would ask why coding native? Uh, the reason is simple, because I've been coding with Kotlin for like uh, uh, two years now, ever since the re um, an announcement of the official support. And I really want to explore the, uh, push the limit of Kotlin native to see if it can uh, 
can be used in some marginal and uh, um, some uh, innovative usage. So um, before we dive into the code, I want to do some uh, um, a general introduction on, about Kotlin Native. So Kotlin Native is an LLVM-based backend. Uh, how many here uh, have already heard LLVM? Okay, that's a very uh, nice number. Um, what's LLVM based backend means? We should start with uh, 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 understand what a compiler is designed. So a compiler design typic typically uh, contains two parts. So the source code goes through the front end, middle end, and the back end. Then it becomes the binary which can be executed uh, on different target platforms. So the mid end is uh, um, normally known as also the optimizer. So the LLVM's implementation of the uh, the com compi uh, compiler looks like this, and they need um, inter um, intermediate representation to work. So Kotlin Native as a LLVM backend looks like this, and the, the essential part of Kotlin Native is here. It's turning the intermediate representation of Kotlin code into LLVM uh, inter intermediate representation. Then it c becomes the binary of uh, which we can execute it on, on different platforms. And um, during the process of uh, working with Kotlin Native, you probably see a lot of uh, terminology such as ARM, such as x86, ABI, FPU. All these things can be um, quite important if you, do, you want to understand everything uh, uh, behind the scene, but it's not uh, necessary to really have be, do, uh, be an expert about it. Um, and there's another thing very important before, uh, before starting this kind of project is to know what the Raspberry Pi uh, architecture looks like. So the Raspberry Pi's latest version uses uh, ARM V8 um, chips and uh, it runs on a 32-bit Raspbian uh, version. Currently, there's no 64-bit Raspbian version. It's very important to remember that. And, uh, uh, Currently, and they are saying we will moving to 64-bit. Only there is a uh, value. So I did a quick check with my Raspberry Pi, and I have uh, following informations: um, ARMHF means ARM hard float, and that's just something you have to remember because we're gonna see that in uh, Kotlin native documentations. Kotlin native currently uh, support a different uh, target preset. Um, now you can see why I just mentioned the HF. Uh, in the previous slide. So actually, Kotlin Native is supported on Raspberry Pi. That's our first victory. So we can start our project without problem. And there is a very important sentence in the Kotlin uh, uh, documentation. It said it can be built on other platform which support it. And now, uh, still, before starting, we need to understand what cross-compilation uh, looks like. Cross-compilation means I'm building uh, something uh, on a host machine for the target machine. Uh, taking my, my case as example, I'm using my MacBook Pro uh, to build something uh, which runs on my Raspberry Pi. So I'm taking the source code and I'm using the Kotlin native compiler and I'm up obtaining a, a binary executable which can be run on the target machine. And uh, Two very important components before start coding anything about Kotlin Native is a Conan C, which is a Kotlin Native compiler, and the second is a C interop, which is the tools we use to generate Kotlin wrapper for the C library. And one last most important thing before we dive into the Hello World code is to understand the C uh, interoperability of Kotlin Native. Actually, what we need is very simple. We need to write a, a dev file and uh, combining with the uh, header file of your C library, we can generate the Kotlin, Kotlin wrapper to, uh, uh, to code in Kotlin uh, for the, by using, uh, using the C, uh, C library. So with all that ready, the IntelliJ has already have a perfect support for Kotlin native, so you can actually uh, code either in uh, command line or in IntelliJ. So my setup looks like this uh, now, because Android thinks it's kind of that and I'm switching to my Raspberry Pi. You can see I have a LED which uh, used to tell me if um, a LED is blinking. I have a button which uh, uh, receives my, my actions. And if you've never worked on a Raspberry Pi before, uh, just have to know we're using several very important GPIO here. GPIO means general uh, purpose input and output. And there are the pins which can receive uh, uh, different information and give different informations. <coughs> 
and the whole uh, the whole schema like this, um, and it's it's uh, it's just for your references. So I started the project kind of at the beginning of the year. Uh, I was trying to cross compile uh, Kotlin native on my MacBook, but it's very hard because I get an exception right away. It was saying um, your target is not yet available on the Mac OS uh, host. I was devastated at this point, which means I have to find a Linux machine. So what I did was um, uh, uh, install the virtual machine, and I also used some Docker to cross-compile with a Linux uh, system. And two months later, uh, Kotlin Native released a new version, and there is a small line hidden in the release note, which cheered me up uh, a lot. And this moment, from this moment, uh, I can now uh, compile code on my MacBook. So. Step zero, hello Kotlin native. This is a very simple uh, application, everybody can write it. And thanks to an article um, written by um, Hadi Hariri, and we can compile it and simply copy the binary onto the Raspberry Pi. So that's the very, very first Kotlin native I wrote for my Raspberry Pi and which worked. I was happy, then I moved on to the next step, was trying to uh, manipulate some uh, basic GPIOs. So uh, in this step, I was trying to um, uh, make the LED blink. There are different uh, libraries we can use to control the GPIOs. One of the most famous one is a Pi GPIO, which is a very tiny C library um, and has been widely used by the community. There's an another uh, library called WiringP. So judging, uh, judging from the CSS level, you can see it's not a JavaScript uh, library. That's a joke I heard on another talk. <laughs> um, having the C library uh, available, uh, now it's time to make it work. Uh, as you might recall, uh, to, um, uh, in order to, to make a C library work, we have to generate Kotlin stuff. So how does that work? Start by creating a, a dev file, and with the tools Kotlin native provided, we can make it happen. And we break down step by step. The dev file looks really, really simple. You just have to uh, specify which is the header file. Then with this header file, we just have one command line to generate the calling stub. To break down this line, so we have an um, uh, option called COPT, which means compiler options. Here we specify where is our header file. Then we go on to, to tell the compiler, to tell the tool, which is a C interop, what's the output file looks like. And we're compiling for the uh, Raspberry Pi target. Um, sorry. Uh, so once does, uh, I think there's something wrong with the, OK. So once does this finish, um, I actually got uh, some Kotlin, uh, Kotlin. So I can actually get some Kotlin uh, wrapper for the PI GPIO. Um, in order to make the LED blinking, we have to use the basics of the GPIO uh, uh, library. So we have to initialize them. We have to set the mode, which can be input or the output. So for the LED, is output, because it's uh, blinking as an output signal. And we have to write values. So one means uh, a LED is uh, uh, on and uh, zero means uh, LED is off. And in order to make it blink, we have to uh, tell the pin to sleep from time to time. So actually, the final code looks like this, which is really, really simple. And uh, I can also show you um, the code which generates. So the code actually, when I run the command line, it generates several things. It generates a uh, K library, and uh, it uses the dev file and the header file, which is here. So keep going. That's the first um, program which makes my lad blink. Um, but it's not the, the end of the steps. Uh, in order to make the executable, I have to build um, the source code with the right library. Uh, by linking the right, by right library, I have to use the right um, file, which is actually you need to build the file on P. Why is that? Because um, for different uh, type of architectures, library contains different linkers. So what I had to do was um, clone the project on my P and build it on my P. So um, from then, I obtained a, a point .so, which is a file uh, I can use in my um, compiler. Uh, 
Then this line helps me compile the code I just wrote and generate an output called led point uh, k exit, which is the binary ex executable which can be run on the Raspberry Pi. And from that on, uh, it works. And I, I was thinking um, command line is nice, but we should always improve our uh, development condition. So I was decided to move the project into IntelliJ. So currently, there's a lot of articles telling you about how to um, configure a Kotlin a cross platform like, um, or Kotlin native project, but they're generally out of date and there's no much documentation at the moment. But in the um, repository of Kotlin native, there are a lot of examples and they're using the recent APIs. And I think I tried the different solutions and I find a one working solutions. So in this file, you can find the essential part. For example, this is a folder where I, ha I have my header file. And this is um, a library I linked to my binaries. And also, I started to do a lot of uh, uh, SCP in order to copy my uh, generated binary to my Raspberry Pi. I was saying, let's also automate this step. So I uh, found um, a Gradle plugin which does the job. Actually, uh, with some configuration on your Raspberry Pi, you can ac access it uh, directly without password. And at the end, 20 lines of code saved me a lot of time by uh, relaunching uh, SCP all the time which can uh, largely improve the, 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 the speed of uh, testing. So I have my lab blinking at this moment. I want to do something a little bit more advanced. I was thinking, um, so the, the, the binary, once it's launched, it's in a continuous loop. So how can I, how can I actually interact with the application? Um, I have to interact with a physical uh, input, just like what you saw in the video. So I have to have a button. Whenever I click on the button, and it uh, triggers all the action uh, we, we need. But how does the callback work uh, with coding native when calling a C library in this kind of circumstances? So that's a moment you should always read the code source. Um, source code, sorry. Uh, so when you look into the PyGPIO uh, code source, there is a function called the GPIO set alarm function. It took in uh, the GPIO's number and it took in another function, which is a sort of a callback. So reading, if you've ever done uh, C before, it looks quite easy. But what happens when it's translated into Kotlin native? So that's what's generated by the coding native. As you can see, it's a type alias of a C pointer, um, of a C function wrapped by a C pointer. Inside the C function, we see something familiar. It's a kind of a lambda. So I was asking question, how can I actually write something in Kotlin which can be taken by this library, C library and works on my Raspberry Pi? So I start to uh, break down the function. As you can see, GPIO level and tick, these three parameters are mapped here. And I just have to figure out how to write a, a, a C pointer for a C function. All this looks kind of obscure, but once you start to read the documentation, you will realize um, they have considered it. So there is um, a wrapper called static C function, which maps the Kotlin function um, into the C function. And that moment, I was kind of relieved. So finally, the code looks like this. You have a, a typical um, Kotlin lambda. And with the static C function, you can actually uh, turn it into something uh, the libra C library needed. And from that on, uh, my, my button click callback actually works, which is really nice. OK. That's another step forward in terms of building my hand robot with coding native. Now I have to tackle the fact that I have to control different server motors in order to make this thing work. In order to do that, you have to understand what's the server motors behind the server motor. So there is a protocol called uh, uh, I2C. So I2C basically it's um, a, a master slave uh, protocols. Um, as you can see, the driver I showed earlier in the slide, it's the slave, and my Raspberry Pi is the master. So the master is giving out orders to slave and telling him what to, do, uh, telling him or her what to do. Um, 
And now I'm using another two port, which is SDA1 and SCL. So SDA means uh, is the ping which I receive the data, and SCL is a ping I uh, use to um, synchronize the master and the slave. Um, so my installation looks a little bit more uh, complicated than, uh, than like five minutes ago. So you can see here is a driver. It's uh, powered by an external power, and it has three server motors uh, linked. So they can be bind with uh, other stuff in order to make uh, the movements we needed. And um, in order to understand how the um, server motor's value can be set, you have to have an idea on what PWM is. So it's a pulse width modulization. I'm not going to uh, dive into the um, detail of it, but you have to know, uh, you have to know that uh, in order to make a server motor move, uh, it works uh, like this. So you have a different duty circle. By giving different electronical paths, you can uh, make the uh, server motor's arm move differently. So if you are giving, for example, a one uh, millisecond um, pulse within the 20 millisecond um, uh, cycle, you can make it move uh, 90 degrees. If you are giving a, a pulse of two milliseconds, you can make it move uh, uh, even wider. So uh, with that in mind, uh, in the same one transaction, if you are giving uh, the on and off value, you can make the server motor move 90% and move back move 180% uh, or move back to another angles. So we just have to know the value. And this is some hardware knowledge which is required to when, when you are building uh, something like that. At this moment, um, uh, I went on for the search of another C library. So um, in order to find the right C library, you have to know what's the chip which is used on this driver. So th on this driver, the chip's name is PCA9685, uh, which is totally obscure and no problem. And because there are uh, uh, nice people on the internet which who write um, a library for that. And I kind of find this small library uh, essential, but very, very useful. So I start with the same steps by creating a dev file and uh, generating the Kotlin wrapper. And in order to control my server motor, I have to initialize them. So reading the header file of the C library, we can find there are two methods which are essential in order to open and uh, initialize our PWM. The first one is to open the I2C uh, pane. Then we have to give them the right value, which is the frequency of our driver. The code. In Kotlin, looks like this, which takes only uh, maybe 10 lines of code to do that. And once we have the PWM value ready, and now it's the moment to set the value in order to move the server motor. And I was I ran into a problem really quickly because this is a C method. As you can see, it's quite simple to understand. You just have to take uh, the on value and the off value. But once it gets to calling, it looks a little bit different. And we're running into something called C values ref uh, with a U, J, U int var. So that's really obscure if you've never done that before. And the only way to understand is to read the documentation. So the C values references is actually um, designed uh, to use as a calling representative whenever there's a, a parameter which is the type of a, a pointer to a, a, to, a, to a C primitive type. So as you can see here, since I have the um, pointer to an int, it's translated to into a C value references. Okay, documentation is not enough. I need concrete example to know how it works. After a lot of research and uh, hours of reading, I kind of have to figure out that I can use something called native placement to do the memory uh, allocation. And with uh, some uh, of, um, helper extension already existed. And I actually made it, make it work inside our memory scope. So inside the memory scope, there is a lot of uh, uh, native memory allocation uh, happening. I just have to uh, cons uh, construct two sets of values. And uh, since it's a 16-channel um, driver, I have like uh, 16 values for each set of values. That's the first version I managed to make it work, which looks super obscure for people who've never done Kotlin native on Raspberry Pi before. Then, oh wait, 
there's actually simpler solutions because it's just uh, lower on the documentation on the GitHub. And there looks really obscure, but when I translate them into Kotlin code, as you can see, I can actually use something uh, just basically uh, Kotlin primitive types here. Uh, so I have a uint array, and once before passing it to a, a, a method, which is a C method, I just have to, to call the method to C values. So this translates automatically my, um, my int array into something that C library can, can, can recognize and can use. At this point, my server motors start to work. I was really, really happy. I was saying, okay, now I have basically all the necessary parts to make the robots, and now I have to take the photos. How do I take a photo with a uh, Raspberry Pi? Uh, you have to use a, ca a camera module. So I bought a camera module which costs around 25 euros, and it's the version two. And first you have to understand how camera module works on a Raspberry Pi. So there is a, a whole universe of it. There are different applications which are already available for Raspberry Pi. And they're using MMLAL, with, which runs over OpenMax. All those are super ob obscure and uh, abstraction um, and this low level APIs. If you've never done low level uh, stuff before, it's gonna be hard to understand and it's gonna be hard, be hard to exploit it directly. And I didn't really find simple C APIs that I want. I was thinking, I, I'm do I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And then I find there's a POSIX binding, which really saved my life which means I can execute, uh, ex execute some command line from my calling native application. So with that single lines, I just call the um, recipe still, which is an application that helps me take a photo. That's kind of a cheat, but it's okay. I, make, I made it work. All the way here, uh, we have kind of the essential component of making a, a hand robot works but I still want the robot to have the intelligence to tell if uh, the person uh, in front of me is playing a rock, a paper, or a scissor. So I have to maybe make the TensorFlow works on Kotlin, uh, with Kotlin Native on a Raspberry Pi. So I start by uh, looking around. Uh, how many here have already used TensorFlow before? Okay, fewer. Um, so TensorFlow is um, a, a framework, and it's an open source framework built by Google. Um, for very uh, complicated uh, machine learning operations. And they have a version called TensorFlow Lite, which works really well on mobile platforms. And uh, if you are familiar with MLKit, uh, MLKit actually used TensorFlow Lite as a backend. So um, in the version of Android things you've seen earlier in the presentation, I use TensorFlow Lite and with Android, which is uh, pretty easy to um, start because they have a really nice examples and uh, sample code which you can use directly. But when you try to run calling native um, with Tensor, TensorFlow with calling native, there's almost zero support. The only one sample you can find on the internet is uh, written by someone who is really um, strong, uh, who, who knows really well TensorFlow APIs. And I tried this sample out. It's actually inside the Kotlin native sample repository. It works well on my MacBook, and it works well on my Linux machine. And uh, it's not available yet for Raspberry Pi. So I started to um, look at other possibilities. I saw there was a C library of TensorFlow, but the thing is, it's, it's not supported on Linux 32-bit. Uh, and there is a library for Java, but neither not supported on, on Raspberry Pis. But maybe I can start building TensorFlow Lite from the source. So I started with a really obscure um, uh, path down to the something I've not, I'm not sure that something would work or not. So uh, I, have to, I had to fix some uh, errors in the, um, in the bash file, and I started the building process, but currently it's still failing either on my uh, Raspberry Pi or on my Linux machines. So it's a long wait, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out if I can make that work. So this stays as a puzzle of the whole, uh, whole uh, idea. And now I'm, showing, I'm going to show you some uh, cooling native on Raspberry Pi in actions.
so the LED is blinking. It's a basic demo, but it took me a long time to achieve that point. And I also prepared a, a, a image capture, which comes later. As you can see, the image was captured and installed on the Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi. Actually, from that on, I can either using other solutions to make TensorFlow work, I can either use the Python or other um, library. But the thing is, I, I really want to make it work with uh, Kotlin native. But for me, I think it's still something uh, limited um, in terms of uh, doability. So here comes the conclusion. Um, what I did was totally experimental and marginal, and it's not recommended for production. <laughs> And I've only showed you the tip of the iceberg in terms of what a calling native can do with uh, low-level libraries in C. And if you want to start um, on something like this, you have to know a lot of about C and cross-compilation. And you have to be easy with this kind of uh, manipulation. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be really fast, get lost, and don't know what happened. And it's very important to always read the doc and always to read the uh, source code. What I did, the first version, I've open sourced it in the library. But the thing is, I still need a lot of fine tuning in order to make, uh, um, for example, the button, the button press to be precise, because there are a lot of uh, control issues over uh, different layers of code. But it was fun exploring, and I had a lot of um, uh, difficulties. I think on the internet, I only find maybe two or three articles which talks about the same uh, subjects. There's two written by Harvey Hardy, so, uh, Hardy Harari, sorry. And there's another one uh, which is more recent. And I'm planning to keep on working some more in order to explore the possibility of doing other things with, with calling native. And there are some really nice talk of Kotlin native, not really for Raspberry Pi, but last year's Kotlin Conf, there, there, um, uh, there's one, one person who are making some hardware noises uh, with the Kotlin native, which is really cool. And the other one uh, coded a snake game in the console. We're using a lot of uh, uh, system binding APIs. And the three articles I find on the same subjects are here. And thank you. And here is a, a repository for my project. Do you have any questions? Hi. Can you hear me? Sorry. Closer. Uh, really great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on uh, how, how did it work out with the whole debugging between uh, the low-level compiler stuff and working with the hardware. That's something that seems really daunting. Um, OK. So the debugging part, uh, I basically use the print lines all the time to debug. That's, uh, I think everybody does that. Um, the thing is, there's no actually tooling uh, supporting the debug part. But well, whenever you start to do the uh, Gradle build for the project, you actually get kind of detailed uh, arrows. Uh, to tell you what happens uh, for your code. Even your code looks green everywhere, but sometimes it does not compile, but calling native compiler is doing a good job to tell you uh, what's wrong. Other than that, um, cross finger and do print lines. <laughs> Hi. So Hi. now that you took all, all the work to port it to Kotlin native, how hard would it be to port it to the different architecture? Um, it's a piece of cake because like, the code, is, code base is the same, and you can actually build for other uh, architecture which is compatible. But um, if, for example, if you want to make it work for other kind of board, I think it, as long as it's the supported ARM, ARM architecture, should be no problem. 
and uh, the only thing changes like the specific GPIO point, uh, ports and uh, other details. But I think it should work if the whole infrastructure and tooling behind uh, supports the, the compiling. Thank you. Thank you. Did you run in, into any complication with uh, memory management because interpolation with C could be sometimes a bit tricky? Yes, that's why on the slide there is a thing called memscope. So inside memscope, it's um, uh, it's um, up to you to um, it's up to you to do a lot of uh, memory allocation. Actually, you can write memory allocation code outside the memory uh, memscope. That's why you have to uh, manage the pointer yourself and do the release yourself. But if it's inside the mem scope, as I read from the documentation, it's managed by the coding native uh, wrappers. I don't know how does that works, and I have still have a lot of questions on my myself in order to understand how it works. But they have a nice tools for that to work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, I'll be around if you have uh, an other question. Thank you.